tonight we're going to be talking about the future of buildings. Um, I'm Janice Brackett and I had the honor of serving on the steering committee for the 2020 visions um, selections and was uh, with with council member David Robinson FAIA. Um, and as others will talk about, it's, it's one of the first um, joint ventures between the city of Houston and AIA Houston. So we're proud of that partnership and find in many ways that we're continuing that relationship and really um, proud to be part of that. We'll begin here in a couple of minutes and um, we'll probably go till about 7.15 this evening. Glad to be here tonight with you. Um, do want to point out that this exhibit is installed at our new architecture center downtown Houston. If you haven't had a chance to make an appointment and go visit it, I highly recommend uh, scheduling time. We are taking um, up to four people at a time on tours and it is absolutely beautiful. Um, the, the space, our new architecture center home is beautiful. The exhibit looks fantastic. Um, we're really proud of the long journey that we've had um, and, and especially uh, Rusty and all of the team at the AIA of how they've brought us to this place. So please do schedule an appointment to go visit at the Architecture Center Houston. And uh, tonight again, we're gonna be talking about the future of buildings. And um, we do have the Q&A section open. So please post your questions there. We will take questions at the end of the session. Um, and I'll ask my friend and colleague Jaime Sobrino to, to join me on screen. Um, he will be our moderator this evening. Hi, Jaime. Uh, glad to have him from Florida this evening. And, uh, and so Jaime will be moderating this discussion and again, taking the questions in the Q&A. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Jaime. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Janice. Uh, my name is Jaime Sobrino, uh, FAIA. I uh, was part of, uh, honored to be invited to be one of the jurors uh, to this great in initiative uh, put together by the city of Houston, council member David Robinson's office and uh, the AIA Houston chapter. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience to be part of this. Uh, a lot of great projects, a lot of great ideas were discussed. Uh, that have continued to become relevant and maintain their relevance, right? I mean, this was this initiative came as a result of Hurricane Harvey, and you know here we are a couple of years after that, and we're still experiencing uh, a major natural natural uh, climate challenges, uh, as well as others that, that we've encountered in the last uh, uh, year or so, or we're currently going through a pandemic as well. So um, it's been a really exciting opportunity to be part of the jury. Uh, evaluate all the projects, um, and uh, I'll, I'd like to talk a little bit about that process. Uh, we we uh, we convened, uh, I believe it was in October uh, before the pandemic, so it was a little bit over a year ago, uh, and we looked at hundreds of, of, of proposals that we received uh, covering a wide range of scales and approaches and topics and just kind of really an interesting uh, uh, menu of, of possibilities, uh, you know, going from uh, infrastructure uh, to uh, uh, financial approaches to uh, coding approaches, uh, uh, you know, a small scale, uh, even sometimes uh, some proposals talked about specific uh, elements in a building. So it was a really, uh, you know, a wide range of ideas and, and, and a different scale. So uh, the jury kind of looked at them and, and formulated uh, an approach to categorize them based on the predominant qualities that, uh, that were similar in many of the projects and many of the proposals. So we ended up creating these different uh, categories or, or groups of proposals that kind of addressed a overarching theme um, that united them and, and helped us uh, put them under a certain topic. And these were topics that were not necessarily given, they were not given to the jury, they just kind of occurred as we analyzed the proposals and we and we saw the similarities and we saw the certain connections between them. 
So these are topics that just kind of were a result of the the wide range of proposals that we received. So you know we received we we have uh, we labeled them into five different categories. Uh, one of them was titled Prairie to Bay Ecology, which dealt with a lot of projects that had to do with um, environmental issues about living, you know, in the Houston area and and plains and the floodplains and and all those kinds of long, you know, or wide ranging environmental impacts around the city of Houston. Uh, there was another category that dealt with titled Future of Energy and Economy, and this one tackled on you know, energy resources, sustainability, uh, some of the economic uh, impacts of resiliency and sustainability as well. Uh, another another topic that we, or another group was uh, titled Hubs, which kind of really focused on, on uh, these different, uh, different centers within the city that could create uh, some, uh, some hubs, for lack of a better term, uh, or a different term, to to kind of show how the city could grow or revolve around these different hubs and how could they be interconnected. Uh, green corridors was another topic, which focused really on establishing connections within the city of Houston that could help in the sustainability aspect of the city and then the resiliency aspect of the city of Houston. Uh, and then finally, the future of buildings, which was really kind of uh, collected the proposals that were more focused on the individual or uh, the, the building itself. Um, the other proposals were the other categories as I've, as I've talked about were more wide ranging and talked more about infrastructure and, and overall environment. Future of buildings categories just kind of really focused on that elemental piece of the uh of of the city which is the building and that's kind of how we came up with this group and uh, we categorized uh the, pro the proposal that really delve into the specific building whether it was a commercial whether it was a residential and just focus really on the building and not necessarily the neighborhood aspect of it um, or the infrastructure aspect of it. There's also, uh, um, it also covered approaches that dealt with buildings in the sense of coding and, and permitting and how things can be rezoned and that sort of thing. But it was really essentially about uh, uh, buildings and the future of buildings as we, as we decided to call it. So that was kind of giving you an, an overview of, of the approach uh, that we, we took as far as grouping the projects. and. Uh, and just kind of trying to, to uh, create or form these different uh, areas of, of focus that we thought were, would be clear in distinguishing the different levels of approach. I think one of the particular things about this group in, uh, is really the aspect of it being scalable and the great potential for implementation as we are doing dealing specifically with buildings. Um, so uh, having said that, I guess I'd like to turn it over to Ryan Slattery from the Recovery Office of the City of Houston to talk to us about uh, the proposal he presented in his group. Ryan. Good evening, thank you so much. Um, the day I initially submitted this for consideration was the two year anniversary of Hurricane Harvey. A lot has changed since then, and like most things recovery related, this has not been a static project for me. For us, this started as a concept, stitched together by looking at other resilient efforts, and hopefully develop an application that is unique to Houston. These concepts turned into a plan, plan was paired with opportunity, and ultimately a small real world effort came into focus that we could build on. Um, I work for the city of Houston, um, and I don't believe the phrase, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, should cause people anxiety. I believe the city is two things. Thing one, we're a customer service organization. We're committed to the public that we serve and in order to best serve the public, we have to be thing two, a leadership organization. Through efforts like Resilient Houston, the Climate Action Plan, Vision Zero, and certainly this collaboration with AIA Houston, shepherded by Councilmember Robinson, the city has continued to embrace its role as both civic leader and public servant. So when this was submitted, I fully expected that we'd be able to develop into 
some solution drawing on both Resilient Houston and the Climate Action Plan. Having said that, I would encourage everyone to visit Architecture Center Houston, see where this concept started, and see all of the amazing projects focused on innovative ways to help Houston build forward. The projects represent the very best of our professional community. While I began this effort painting with a broad brushstroke, I'd like to focus my time this evening on apartments, um, equitable, affordable housing to be specific. Before we discuss resilient buildings or mitigation or jobs, it's important to understand why, or more to the point, who. 57% of Houstonians rent their home. Put that into perspective, renter occupied units made up about 30% national inventory in the fourth quarter of 2020. 46% of renters in Houston spend more than 30% of their income on housing. 23% spend more than half. 60% of Houston's children live in rental units and 66 are foreign born. And 47% of all uh, 47 of all households were impact, that were impacted by Hurricane Harvey were renters. Fewer renters carry insurance than homeowners, increasing their vulnerability to a wide range of disasters from flooding, the notably and most recently extreme cold well, extreme heat. With this in mind, considering our affordable housing stock was and still is well below where we needed to be, establishing and fortifying equitable, affordable housing opportunities for our Houstonians who rent has been a priority for us. It's also important to consider our environment. Houston is an expansive prairie. Um, Roughly 50 miles inland, we're maybe 50 feet above sea level. That prairie is brought to life through a network of 22 watersheds, intricate system of bayous that can be celebrated as an attraction. They can cause a great deal of heartburn when they begin to swell. They are a required natural consideration. It's impossible to develop in Houston and not know how close you might be to a bayou, a creek, or a gully. So it's no surprise there are approximately 162,000 buildings in the 236 square miles of map floodplains. So in order to better protect our neighbors, be mindful of our natural environments, we simply have to be smarter about how we build. It's important to note that one in five new homes that were permitted in Houston the year after Hurricane Harvey is in the floodplain. So it should also come as no surprise that Houston has adopted one of the most strict floodplain ordinances in the country. That said, 59% of all flood damage resulting from Harvey happening outside of any defined floodplain. Which brings us to the thesis of this chat. How do we codify a set of standards that extends protections to all of Houston? All of Houston? Start by taking into account grants from FEMA, HUD, Economic Development Administration, whose staff collaborate with National Institute of Building Sciences to produce annual reports that estimate the $27 billion spent in mitigation over the past 23 years has yielded $150 billion in societal savings. Many of, these inf many of these interventions are simple. Hurricane shutters, replacing flammable roofs, clearing vegetations close to structures. And to go a step further and to provide insight into, into the trajectory of this particular chat, for every dollar that we spend on building to the most current model building codes, $11 are saved in recovery costs. We can't solely rely on large scale infrastructure to be more resilient and adaptive to our changing climate. We have to think about our built environment, our buildings and our structures. It's part of that holistic mitigating system. So for us, this was the fun part. In response to Hurricane Harvey, Houston's Housing and Community Development Department stood up a number of programs made possible through significant HUD community development block grant disaster recovery dollars. 350 million of those dollars were allocated for the development of quality affordable housing throughout Houston. 30 projects that take advantage of CDBG DR funding are transit oriented, located in high opportunity communities like the one that I live in, the Heights, and have access to food, healthcare, and other services like quality public schools. They are also more resilient structures. Working with the Chief Resilience Officer and leveraging our recovery effort to advance resilient, resilient Houston, the Housing Department developed additional standards that further protect the folks who will ultimately call these communities home. Some of these efforts are intuitive considerations, elevating living spaces, relocating critical equipment to higher floors. Others are more of a financial long-term commitment, green infrastructure measures and pre-wiring for solar electric vehicles. It's important to note, 
Texas is second only to California as a green job incubator. With 230,000 jobs across the state, solar, energy efficiency, and wind, while COVID has slowed almost all job growth, prior to COVID, green jobs consistently grew annually by 3%, nationally, 5% in Texas. The National Institute of Building Science estimates that the cost of construction has increased slightly as a direct result of code development since 1990, about 0.3%. They also state that if new buildings were built to exceed commonly adopted I-code requirements, the extra materials and labor would add $3.6 billion in construction expenses nationally. And when we, when we talk about exceeding commonly adopted I-codes, what they're talking about is uh, new buildings that comply with IBHS fortified standards. Just as a result of code development, since 1990, 30,000 new jobs have been added to the construction and material industry. And if new design were to exceed 2015 I-code requirements, another 87,000 jobs could be added. Being able to advance these resilient strategies was first and foremost a priority effort to develop strong, equitable, affordable housing stock that helps Houston build forward. Close second to protecting lives and property is the opportunity for collecting data. We're able to start establishing a baseline through this effort that allows us as the city to better understand what's practical, what's ambitious, and what might take just a little bit more finesse. This effort is not unique to housing. Similar rubrics are being developed for, uh, to be applied to our own city facilities and will hopefully inform our code development process. Building codes are a minimum standard, basically the floor. This is not news to anyone here. It's also not news that states and municipalities were through a review and amendment process. Houston is currently in public comment period seeking feedback on the amended amendment suggestions to the 2015 model codes that serve as the foundation for Houston's construction code. Code amendments are important and they vary from one jurisdiction to another. California, for instance, their last update included a first in the nation requirement that new single family low rise apartments be powered by solar energy. Pair that with better insulation, better windows, you begin reducing costs for homeowners and tenants. Conversely, the state of Texas hasn't adopted a new set of codes since 2000. Our truth in Houston is certainly somewhere in the middle. What works in California for Californians isn't necessarily true for Houstonians. But I also don't believe building codes should be old enough to buy beer. I do believe resilient building principles like pre-wiring for solar are worthy of the minimum standard conversation. We're advancing in a more climate conscious world and are having more and more conversations about on-site solar. It shouldn't just be the new buildings that advance with the times. I also believe that continuous insulation outside of the studs, protecting pipes, are worthy of the minimum standard conversation. I believe folks that are struggling with high utility bills and busted pipes might be inclined to agree. How we address our building codes and standards is our collective responsibility. I mentioned earlier that we're in the middle of our public comment for Houston's 2015 construction code. Both the Resilient Houston Strategy and the Climate Action Plan have established benchmarks calling for Houston to adopt 2021 model codes by 2025. 2025 is an important year for both strategies. By then, we hope to power all municipal operations with renewable energy, have completed 100 green stormwater infrastructure projects like the ones included in our affordable housing developments and attract and incubate 50 energy 2.0 companies in greater Houston area, just to name a few. I'd like to encourage everyone to take advantage of this public comment period, submit your thoughts and concerns. Most importantly, share your expertise. I'll close by saying this, we need your help. Just like I didn't want this submission to be static, I don't want this discussion to only live here in this 15 minutes. Our office prides itself on being able to facilitate conversations between smart people to get good things done. I began this chat with a profile of the Houston renter because before we decide how we build, we should understand who we're building for. It also serves as an excellent model where we were able to promote quality developments that are resilient and equitable through a collaborative process that brings together the private, public, and nonprofit sectors through to advance a common cause. That same spirit of collaboration can help us develop a standard that is by no means minimal. Thank you very much for bearing with me this evening. My name is Ryan Slattery. I'm from the government and I'm here to help.
Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. So it, it's uh, it, the presentation really, uh, you know, brings to light the importance of, you know, zoning and guidelines and how these things can can be implemented to benefit, uh, you know, from further damage happening in the future. And I think it brings to the forefront the, the relevance and the importance of it as a as a tool. You usually think about a built solution, but uh, sometimes these codes and these uh, uh, parameters uh, can can be just as impactful and, and maybe even so at a, you know at a grander scale when applied or implemented uh, appropriately. So thank you for that. Um, up next, we have um, Taylor Turchik from the Gensler and Paulina Abadia from Gensler as well with their proposal for high hackers. Ladies. Thank you, Jaime. Um, you so said her I'm, names perfectly. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> um, yeah, so, okay. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm Taylor and I'm here with Paulina um, from Gensler here to present our project, High Hackers. Um, and this proposal looks at reinvestigating Houston's uh, vertical urban fabric. Um, so it's kind of small on the screen, but we wanted to start this presentation with a quote uh, from the Wall Street Journal. And this was from 2016, whenever we first started the research for this project. Um, so traveling back in time a little bit, noting some of these significant events happening um, around then, you know, due to the oil crisis, there was a downturn in the economy um, and it led to a loss of jobs and then ultimately empty real estate. And so part of the quote, you can see it says that 7.6 million square feet um, of of office space was vacant in the greater Houston area. And we're definitely aware that since 2016, there's been what feels like a crisis after a crisis, mainly Harvey, um, our best friend, COVID-19, and the most recent ice apocalypse that had happened. But we feel like that our proposal in particular is able to react to even those most recent disasters. And we can talk more about that later, but during, um, while we were doing this research back in 2016, we discovered that about 19 buildings in downtown alone were at least 20% unoccupied and available for lease. And the idea of hackers really is kind of a culture that takes what's existing and creates something totally different, which is what we want to channel whenever we were doing this project, when we're making kind of a new generation of co-working space um through repurposing vacant offices and doing it in a more like organic and experimental process so um going to the next slide i'm understanding that the houston market in particular um maybe want to shift from oil and gas uh, we wanted to cater to a different market creators and innovators for example you know the startup community maybe and so We've chosen three different groups, user groups. Um, we categorize them as the maker, the artist, and the academic. You know, the maker being somebody who works with their hands, a welder, a seamstress, um, the artist, of course, and then an academic, um, doctors, scientists. Uh, we understand that a lot of these descriptions are interchangeable with trades, uh, but we felt that these groups had a wide range of programmatic needs that we could test just to develop our idea. Yes, and with those different programmatic needs, they have different functions that require different spaces that a typical office layout at times will fail to provide. And so to set up that foundation um, for our new co-working prototype, um, instead of a user leasing an office space, they would essentially just rent a pod. And so we developed the three basic pod types based on those user groups. And so the first pod being flexible, um, adjustable casework requires a lot of desk space for like writing, drafting, computing of those sorts. And then the second pod um, designed to maximize a bunch of storage space uh, for different types of equipment. Third pod being maybe just four blank walls um, to adapt for um, a space for an artist pinup or a recording studio. So just a wide range sort of, of programmatic needs. And all of these pods are modular, but they're also, well, we would want them to be both mobile and flexible, um, which gives the user basic programmatic space, 
but it also allows them to go in, hack their pods to cater to whatever specific needs that they're working with. And that's kind of how like the experimental organic process starts. Um, so you can see here, we just begin with a typical office floor plate um, of what you would see in downtown Houston or, you know, any high rise. Um, and so the pods essentially are placed on the typical floor plate, um, treated, the floor plates treated as communal space for the users. And the pods aren't placed strategically, but they're, you know, wherever the user would want to place them and they're free to sort of move about in any configuration. Um, and then each pod itself can be configured in different ways, um, modular so that they can attach together, pull apart, um, and then they would create a larger network of pods moving forward. And we felt that this gave the user the ability to define their space more as they sort of settled into their work and needed to just grow and grow and expand. And this uh, modular pod strategy, if you will, um, let's a user who may not have a ton of financial resources in the beginning of their venture, they're able to save costs on a long-term commitment of building out an, off, an entire office floor. And the overall idea of different users with their pods coexisting in an open floor plan enhances the ability for cross-collaboration, spurring new relationships. And I know I'm sounding like an ad, but it is really true and we do really want that to happen in workplace. Um, and they are like creating these new relationships for the users and, and it proves usability um, and able to really activate the office space for the building owner. With that said, you know, we want to think bigger. This is, you know, vision 2020. And we ask ourselves what would happen once a company progresses enough and they're you know, they get more funding and they can really invest in a more permanent location, but without wanting or needing to move to a different space. Yeah, so the user of these pods, we envision at a certain point in the career development, um, the company entity user, you know, may now have the means to just physically change their space um, and they can hack the pod itself, you know, in the modular way is what we had mentioned. Um, and, but they can permanently transform and adapt to what they need as an individual um, or individual entity. And you know, they can start to define their space a little bit more, um, create larger open areas, um, adding structure and you know, different walls or wherever they see fit. Yeah, and the fact that they can stay in the same place they originally hacked not only avoids the hassles of moving, but also it allows them to one, continue working in that same very like hyper collaborative environment and to continue working in downtown Houston. They don't have to go off to, you know, the boonies to do that. And they can still be part of this larger urban network. So theoretically the users have now chosen to build out their own space, right? And um, we just, as high hackers, we wanted to push it just a little bit further. So this is, you know, deep breath. This is kind of where the ultimate hacking happens. Um, where the users are given the ability to hack the entire building or, you know, their portion of it. And they're creating spaces that typically wouldn't be housed in an office building. And they're able to transform everything from the interiors all the way through the building facade. So, yeah, I, I really like this slide because you can see the progression of all of the office floor plates is what we just mentioned. Um, you can see how they're changing um, when the user groups are combined with each other and how it's manipulated over time. Theoretically and, you know, diagrammatically, it just represents what that change might be. Yeah, and I also think what's really cool and kind of fun about this project is because we started out with these pods, which were modular, flexible, and it's turned or it can turn into something that is extremely customized for them. And now that the hacking has pushed through like the exterior walls, it definitely has an effect of um, kind of what it looks like from pedestrian view and it affects kind of the overall Houston skyline. And on the next slide, you'll be able to. <laughs> yeah, so we had a lot of, um... If we go back one slide, um, we had a lot of, you know, buildings to choose from as sort of to develop our scheme, right? So um, if you recognize this building, this is the Exxon, old Exxon building, um, 800 Bell. 
uh, currently vacated. So we decided to graphically test out what our fully high hacked building would look like. And that's what we came up with. <laughs> it's kind of a lot. And but you could tell that we definitely you know, we are the ones kind of like designing it in an organic way, but that's kind of how we envision what, you know, 20 other people will come up with and then, it all, and then it'll be combined together into that. Yeah, we had a lot of fun putting this together, um, but, you know, looking at the different programs in the space, you see a performing arts auditorium at the penthouse at the high rise, or, you know, we think that if there was a, a botanist sort of in their own pod doing their own thing and there was a landscape architect next to them, well, they would see what each other was doing and then, you know, maybe an idea would spark and they would create this entire vertical urban park throughout the building. And the, the picture right now may be like small on your screen. So I, again, want to plug in that there is a physical exhibit and you can see this drawing in real life and it's like eight, maybe nine feet tall. and that's when you can like really look at it. If you're like me, I like, love looking at large drawings and you can see all the random crazy stuff that we put in there. And while, you know, we're still dreaming big, you know, you can start, you can go into um, a building and just start thinking like, oh, okay, one day you'll look up and see maybe a vertical garden is next to like a wood shop on top of a climbing wall underneath like 10 different building curtain wall systems on one facade. It's, you know, that's the limit. <laughs> yeah, just like a bunch of different opportunities for public spaces, schools, museums, recreation centers, infiltrating the building, all housed together under one sort of roof. And then, you know, in the beginning, the botanist pod, as I just mentioned, um, they just sort of collaborate with each other and then sort of create this masterpiece is what you see here. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, we I can spend hours like shouting wild ideas of what can go in a building and trust us like we do that all the time but what to wrap it up um, what really it boils down to is that when you give someone a, f a good foundation to produce good work they can go anywhere um, that user group can take any of their ideas and move forward and it can be amazing and and that's what we want to encourage with high hackers that type of imagination and really this proposal establishes a place for that vision. So thanks everyone for listening. Um, we would love to know what you guys are thinking. <laughs> if you think we're crazy, that's fine too. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks everyone. Okay, thank you, Paulina, and thank you, Tyler. Um, I guess we, you know, this is kind of our uh, Q and A period now so if anybody has any questions please feel free to add them onto the chat um, and we'll, we'll we'll kind of uh, run by run it through the, the, the different panelists um, I see that Ryan has uh, posted a link uh, for public doc comment on the documents he mentioned in his presentation so uh, please everybody on the call make sure to check it out and click on the link I think that's important really to to kind of uh, review them and, and, and voice your opinion and comments, like Ryan said, you know, just kind of a good, uh, it's important to get that kind of input and that feedback for, for all these things to be uh, successful and implemented. Um, I do have one question uh, that we received in the chat. Uh, I think this is more on, on Ryan's uh, bandwagon, but uh, let's see. Uh, the question is, how does the city decide which buildings to buy out? For multifamily buildings, has the city identified comparable housing for the tenants to move into? Yeah, so there there is a, a methodology to to how we acquire properties. I, I, to to be very general about it, uh, our our priority is to get people out of harm's way. So repetitive loss is important to to us in our consideration. Um, I would love. I don't. Um, uh, yeah, I hope that, uh, and I'll put my contact information in the chat, my email, my cell phone. Um, uh, if you want to reach out directly to me, I can put you in touch with our housing and community development department that spearhead those types of, of, of conversations. And they're the ones who do the, the voodoo of uh, understanding what properties are priorities. They do the rank and measuring, uh, the weight and measuring of, 
of, of those facilities. So I'll put my I'll put my contact information in the chat and uh, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, and uh, I'll put you in touch with housing and community development and they can get you a very specific answer to how we approach uh, buyout and how we approach relocation as well. Hi, mate. At the risk of interrupting, Councilmember Robinson here, just wanting to add to what Ryan said. Um, and thank you guys for this presentation. There's lots of great information. I, I first of all, want to emphasize what the presenters have said about the, the show itself and how worthwhile it is to get to the space because it's, it's really great to see what these um, two young women have put together to see and it's even better live when you can get up close and study the detail in the High Hackers presentation. And <clears throat> the presentation Ryan has put together on behalf of the city is excellent. But I think to the question that was asked in the chat, um, there's a phrase we use at the city of Houston, which is severe repetitive loss. And you know there is priority for those um, facilities, houses and buildings so deep in the floodplain that they are susceptible and have proven to be troublesome um, for our affordable housing stock, for commercial buildings, they simply need to get out of there. And we actually had a project, um, a multifamily housing project in District K on the southwest side of town this past week on the agenda for city council. And we, um, we have provided funds to buy it out, federal funds. And that's how Ryan's department and the Office of Resiliency working together with the recovery office and some of the federal funds and other programs were working together, as Ryan said, with the housing department and the GLO that we are working together to truly try to get those who are most threatened prioritized and, um, you know, to use a Dutch expression, provide room for the river and the bayous in our case, and to really pull back uh, as much as we can with a, a phased but very deliberate process. So there's my two cents. Okay. Okay. Well, I, since you're since you're on since you're on <laughs> councilman, council member, uh, I've got another question here. Uh, uh, what happened to all the money that the federal government sent to Houston for ha Harvey recovery? Well, that's a great question. How long do we have again? Um, <laughs> we, we, yeah, right. Um, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna attempt to answer that except to explain that it's a complicated answer and it's a good question. Uh, but um, and and this is not a time uh, to blame anyone. But I will tell you that so much of the federal programs working with the GLO and utilizing those dollars in the way that we have wanted to make sure that they are spent efficiently, effectively, and again. Uh, for the purpose of the dollars that have been allocated, it is not a simple task. So what Ryan is doing with the the Chief Resiliency Office and the, the Mayor's Administration, as well as the Housing Department, have many challenges for compliance and for working within the federal programs to demonstrate that we are compliant <clears throat> following the rules of order. We are working with the General Land Office, the GLO, Commissioner um, George P. Bush, and while I think that the news has covered some challenges inherent to that exchange of funds that have never come directly to the city of Houston, uh, the administrative uh, requirement for um, the effectivity of the program has not been easy. So that, that's not by way of an excuse, yep. but it uh, hopefully will provide some explanation. We are ramping up. If the director of the housing department, Tom McCaslin was here, he would talk about those that are in the pipeline, the, the ramping up for uh, effective programs going forward. And that's where I think I'd ask the person who's written the question in the chat to, to watch what's about to happen because we are really geared up for some formidable building and, uh, um, I think we're in great shape to do that, including with some affordable housing design that has come from AI uh, licensed members uh, from the local chapter. And I would uh, I would like to uh, reiterate that the 350 million dollars uh, for the affordable housing uh, 
programs that, that, that I was discussing, that is Harvey recovery. Those are Harvey recovery dollars. So that $350 million contributed to a billion dollar investment in affordable housing throughout the city of Houston. Um, those, those, those are transit oriented projects. They're in good uh, public school pathways. They have access to uh, uh, a lot of amenities. Um, and some of, the, some of the dollars go to programs that you don't necessarily see. Um, celebrating the news, public service dollars. Um, we go to nonprofit organizations to, to help people uh, further recover from hur Hurricane Harvey. Um, if you go to, I'll put this in the chat as well. If you go to recovery.houstontx.gov, um, they'll give you a breakdown of where all of these dollars are being spent, how all of these programs are, 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 are working and in what step of the process all of these, all of these programs are. Um, so I'll put that in the chat. You can go see how we're spending the money um, and, and we certainly uh, are, are open to critique and we, we, we love to hear um, how we're doing. And, and I invite you to, to engage with us. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess shifting back to uh, the, the high hackers proposal with, with Taylor and Paulina. Um, so how, I mean, when you did the analysis and you went through the, the whole process, um, you know, I, I believe at some point you started this even prior to Harvey and, and it's kind of evolved and it continues to evolve with, with, with the pandemic that we're currently going on. So how do you see this proposal, you know, evolving or uh, would you change anything with the new challenges that we're facing now? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I can kind of start answering the question, Taylor, just chime in whenever you want. But yes, we started this pre-Harvey. Harvey has not ha happened yet. And um, we really, you know, we kind of started it with just workspace, but I think it can, you know, evolve into, you know, going into housing, going into more of a mixed use setting. Um, but the idea of kind of stacking um, worlds is not new. Like you can, everyone research like Archigrams plug-in city in the back in the 60s which was kind of brought out by a need of you know not enough space so people need to build up and what that would look like and those kind of theories within that but how we approach it is we have too much space and what do we do with that and we can still kind of um bring in the logic of combining people but in a in a sort of different approach so i think it could you know it's it's this idea is old, always evolving, and it's, you know, it's always going to continue to evolve based on what people need and what people need is changing. And I think that's why, like, starting with a modular strategy is good for those um, types of, um, I guess, problems, design problems, world problems. Um, yeah, no, I just plug into that. I think the way that we presented the project um, was that it was sort of organically formed with itself. And so I think that, you know, organically it can adapt to some of the disasters and, you know, social distancing and, you know, whatever might come up just on the way that people interact or want to interact with each other. Um, so I, I think that it has potential in sort of responding to those ideas. So and it's definitely market say? driven. Whatever you plug right. in is what, you know, the market needs or wants at the. So, so what do you, what do you see could, would be the main challenges to implement an initiative like, like that in the, in the building that you've picked, for example, you know, what, what are the challenges of actually having that occur? Well, um, I think what would, you know, ev on everybody and any like building owner, building management, they're always thinking about cost. And, you know, what is the cost comparison between, you know, leasing, leasing a floor versus, you know, generating these like furniture casework pods versus getting a company to build somewhere else and doing a ground up building. Because that's going to be like a major um analysis that a lot of people are going to want. And I feel like once we get that across, um, just like the feasibility of everything, um, we can start there. And then the next is how it's going to be leased and how is, how are you going to 
separate the different types of occupancies because we're proposing kind of really weird occupancy groups and, you know, even adjacencies that may not, you know, be allowed depending on building code. Um, so I think those are two things that I can think of. Um, Taylor, do you have? Uh, I, yeah, more? I would say that the, the next challenge would be the, you know, physical construction of how you would hack a building um, mm -hmm. and how you start to take it apart or, you know, do the, the crazy things that we were suggesting. Um, I think that's a whole nother conversation about the constructability and, you know, whether or not it works and, you know, how much is implemented into doing that and, you know, sort of making it as what we're proposing. So. Okay. And, um, and Ryan, I guess uh, the same question for you, uh, you know, I know you're, you're kind of on, going through this, this uh, document process and public comments, but what do you think are, are kind of uh, the main challenges of, of, the efforts that you're taking on right now in the city of Houston and how do you, how do you see them potentially being a, a you know, a solution uh, to, to a lot of the city's problems? So as I look at, I look at building codes and, and, and I look at a, a mechanism to uh, protect people, uh, to ensure the safety, the health and the welfare of, of uh, people who live and work in, in our buildings. Um, we want to be out front leading in these efforts. That's why we want to um, take these resilient standards and apply them to our own facilities, take these resilient standards and apply them to um, um, our projects that we're uh, supplying gap funding for, uh, federal funding for, um, to, to serve as that, that, that uh that pilot to, to go out into the community, not just the AEC community, but the, the general, uh, general public and say, these are, these are the, the, the things that we can do to make our people safer. And at the heart of building codes, that is what um, we're trying to do. We're trying to protect people at the heart of resilient uh, at the heart of, 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 of resilience is that same, are those same protections. Um, it's a democratic process. Um, in, in order to, to facilitate that, it takes time. Um, this is a long process. Um, like I said, we will close out public comment April 7th, um, I believe, is when public comment for the 2015 building codes it, it closes out and then those amendments have to be incorporated then it goes to council for for consideration uh hopefully adoption and then we need to begin a process of looking at 2021 and that is going to be a long process um, so the things that, that that are are tricky um is is timing what people assume how long it how long people assume the process should take and how long it actually takes. Those two things never really line up. Um, so under understanding that and being able to get out in front of that and, and talk to people about that. And, and I don't want to say manage expectations, but educate people on what the value in doing this process right is. Um, and that means it's going to take some time. Um, but that also means that we have to start really quickly to start looking at like i said by 2025 we want to we want to start building two 2021 uh, model codes so we have to start that process now if we want to meet that deadline and like that's a, a really good idea of how long it's going to take or how long we're anticipating that it takes we want it to take we want it to be sooner uh, we want but we want it to be right if I could, if I could, if I could maybe editorialize a little bit on Ryan, I think what he said is right on. Um, so the public comment period that is open right now for the update to the code uh, will conclude at the end of March, beginning of April. But that public comment period is really critical. So there's one step before it gets to city council that I think is critical, namely the public comments need to be um, reviewed, digested, considered both by the Public Works Department, 
some of our expert um, engineers within the public works and engineering department, as well as with permitting, our legal department needs to look at it. We need to process all considerations. We hope that it will be a, a, tr a process that is transparent as possible. And it is uh, something that falls under the, my purview as the chair of the TTI Committee for Transportation Technology and Infrastructure, that this matter will come before the council committee prior uh, to what uh, Ryan said, um, city council will consider this. So that is a process that actually takes a little longer than one might expect. It's not gonna happen in April. That'll be the time for public works and legal to digest the comments, probably as I'm told into the month of May, where the first week of June is likely where that process will be concluded and it will come before TTI in the first week of June for discussion amongst council with public comment period again. And that would be prior to going to council, mayor permitting as he uh, controls the agenda for consideration, I'm told before the end of the fiscal year on June 30th. So that it's, it's lengthy. I thought, you know, architects and engineers tend to be on the technical side of this. So Ryan throwing in a little bit of uh, uh, a riff on your point. We're from the government and we're here to help. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, these processes obviously take some time. I do, I do have something, I guess, uh, kind of staying on this whole thing about codes and, and standards. I, I wonder what it would be like to combine both proposals, right? I mean, Ryan, you're working more on standards and an approach. I mean, how do you see the high hackers solution kind of impacting or being part of or uh, aligning with some of the goals that your office is, 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 is set up for, right? And, and the effort that you're going on through now, how does that, I mean, I know your, your proposal deals mostly with, with housing and, and high hackers is right now mostly commercial, but I, I find that there's a there's an intersection at some point right, between both, and and I'm just curious as to how would how would that translate? How would high hackers translate into a set of standards uh, from what you're working with? So I, I don't I don't necessarily think. Yeah. So I think building, I think building code should be performance, right? Um, when we look at uh, a set of building standards, they should allow creatives to be creative when uh, getting to uh, the pres what prescribed standard we're, we're, we're setting. Um, we're, uh, we don't really do elegant um we're 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 uh, we're an instrument um and we i want to be able to allow uh people like taylor and people like paulina to be the creatives and create those elegant solutions that 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 meet uh, a prescribed standard so they while we set a standard we want to set a standard that allows them to to creatively um meet that standard. So I think um, I want to provide them with the latitude to create something like they're proposing, um, an elegant design, um, but I also want it to meet a particular standard. And I think it's a play on creativity and rigidity of standard or rigidity of code. Um, I don't know, that might be a little bit of a, a roundabout, long-winded answer um, to say that I want creatives to create, and I want our job to be the protection of of the people who occupy their space, and I want people to occupy their space and just be worried about the the, the elegant solution that they've created. Yeah, no, and, and you know, my question is really. And there's got to be, like you, like you said, you know, there's a creative side and there's also, you know, is it, is it feasible, right? Is it applicable? And, and obviously High Hackers takes uh, an approach that's, that's highly creative and just trying to push the envelope and just kind of examine the possibilities without, uh, I guess, too many constraints. And, you know, to, <laughs> you know, Paulina and Taylor, you can talk more about this. 
but I just, you know, again, it, it's, it's trying to find that balance, you know, to potentially be able to implement something like this. And that's kind of where I've, you know, that's, that's, that's just kind of the discussion that I've been kind of, uh, I've just, you know, kind of looking at them again and, 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 in, and in comparison, you know, one next to the other, it's like, well, this one talks about standards, this one talks about possibilities. Uh, it's a different ask. It's a it's a different approach, right? You, you, your your presentation, Ryan's presentation, focused more on kind of housing and and kind of urban suburban in a way. And then this is very, you know, hackers is you know highly urban. You know, it's downtown Houston. It's a tower. So, you know, what is kind of like the middle ground? You know, what is kind of uh, you know uh, as as far as Paulina and, and Tyler's proposal? How does how does this how do they tame it down to be, you know, within the standards in a way without without necessarily taming it down? You know, I guess that's kind of where I, you know, just kind of want to hear your thoughts about that. Um, if I could interject, um, I think the whole you know battle between rules and breaking the rules is going to live on forever and ever. Like if you put, you know, constraints, we're going to find a way to say why, like live free. Um, but at the end of the day, anything that we build needs to go through the city. Um, you know, it needs to get permitted and we need to follow building code. Um, what I think is interesting between our project and Ryan's is that um, notion of like, you know, staying away from the floodplain. And also, I don't know if we ever addressed that you, the zoning of Houston is kind of non-existent um i mean there's still rules in place but we kind of have that opportunity to decide what where we want to build you know do people actually want to live in downtown like can we make it somewhere a place that you know has grocery stores and things that necessities for the people because i mean i think both what's in common both of our projects is like we want people to thrive Ryan wants people to thrive at home and, you know, their housing and we want them to thrive in their projects and in the workplace. So, you know, I think we could definitely find some, you know, balance between the two. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, you know, I guess it's because as part of the jury, right. And when we were looking at all the proposals in general, I think one of the things we talked about was, you know, how feasible are these things, right? It's always part of the conversation. I mean, it's Visions 2020. It's it's you know high, you know high level thinking, and that's great. But then at the end of the day, what is the takeaway, right? What mm -hmm. can actually be implemented or further developed to be implemented, right? I and mean, we saw as part of the jury, and, and, and as, as people will see if they visit the exhibit and even the website, and, and they look at the different proposals. There's there's some proposals there that are very you know, uh, practical, right? Uh, uh, and, and then there's others that are really high thinking, but they really bring to the to the forefront some interesting concepts. And I think you know, high hikers is kind of one of those, where it's you know, let's let's look at this in a different way. And it's not necessarily or the way I see it, it's not necessarily an infill project, although it kind of behaves like that. But it's just the different the modularity of it, and then the flexibility of it, and the evolution of the scale of it. Um, I think that's what makes it interesting. So, um, okay. Uh, I I don't have haven't seen any other questions in the chat. Does anybody have anything they want to add or want to talk about? There's one last uh, question in the Q and A, Jaime. Check that out. It says, uh, "Has there been any research into the feasibility oh. for building owners?" Oh yeah, yeah. This one just came in. All right. Yep. That's it. Um, yeah, so I, I think, um, yeah, the, I think that is what Taylor and I are thinking would be the immediate next step is to whenever we're talking to building owners, building management, and, um, and also talking with building, you know, coal jurisdiction and what that looks like and talking to contractors, talking to like, how does the HVAC work in this type of environment? So those are. Lots of next steps that need to happen, but I, I think it can happen, especially how we've kind of phased out the different parts of this project where, you know, you could just start with furniture in the space and designing that specific type of furniture. And then as it moves to like more built out space, you know, that's the next study of feasibility. So 
I'm hopeful. <laughs> yep. Well, there's, there's definitely potential there. All right. I think we've covered every every question we've received. Janice? Yes, thank you, Jaime, and thank you, um, Paulina. Pa I'm sorry, yeah, Paulina and Taylor and, and Ryan and council member for joining us this evening. Uh, big thanks to Jennifer Ward, our associate director at AIA Houston, for helping to coordinate this and keep us all running on track. Um, again, can't emphasize enough how great the exhibit looks in person. Um, so do encourage everybody to please make an appointment to go visit it. Um, go see the new architecture center, go see the, the exhibit in person while it's still up. And um, I think with that, uh, again, thanks to all of you this evening for great discussion and we'll wrap up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having Thanks us. everyone.